Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. So everyone has the ability to live a healthy life, right? You can choose to eat fruit, fresh, fresh fruits and veggies, exercise, not smoke, get enough sleep, and live in a safe, stress-free neighborhood. With the Affordable Care Act, you can even see a doctor when you need to. And if you are poor or elderly, you can use Medicaid or Medicare to pay for a visit. So all is equal, or is it? What do things like your zip code, food deserts, your race, and even the way the healthcare system works have to do with how healthy you are. Up next on Another View, why equality is not enough and why equity must be the goal. We'll be right back. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. A shout out to the faculty, staff, and students at uh, Lutheran Presbyterian School over in Newport News. We had the pleasure of serving as their MC for their breakfast yesterday morning, and we had a great time. So hello, everybody, and hope you're tuning in. Today on Another View on Health, we're going to be talking about health equity. Defined by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation as everyone having a fair and just opportunity to be healthier. On the surface, you may say, sure, we have that. But wait until you hear what our guest has to say about the many disparities that keep us from meeting that goal. Joining me in the studio is the best co-host on the planet. <laughs> His name is Dr. Keith Newby, and he's a cardiologist. Hey, Keith, how you doing? Oh, and you tell me, I like, I like hearing that. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I get that welcome all the time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm doing very, fine. Very and yourself? I'm doing great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And joining us by phone is Ms. Natalie Burke, President and CEO of Common Health Action, a national public health organization that creates solutions to health and policy challenges. Natalie, how are you? Good afternoon, Barbara. I'm great and happy to be with you. you know, we are so excited to have you with us, too. So, you know, people hear the term health equity, and I see their eyes kind of rolling in the back of their heads because it sounds very academic. But I want to ask you, Natalie, to define it for us and then give us a specific example so that people can truly understand what we're talking about. So health equity is really about all people having fair opportunities to achieve their best possible health. Sometimes people will say optimal health. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that your health, my health, Keith's health potential is different. And so part of what's important for people to understand is this. Your health is not an accident. It's a production of society. It's mm -hmm. about 10 to 20 percent genetic about 30 to 40 percent based on personal behavioral choices. You eat right, diet, exercise, engage in risky behavior, wear a seatbelt, wear a condom, wash your hands, no particular order. <laughs> and the 40 to 50, you know, the 40 to 50 percent is the last piece that we talk about that are the social determinants of health, which are systems and institutions that create the context within which we live our lives. So for some of us, we may live in a zip code where we don't have access to healthy food. We may live in a community where we don't have access to primary care, you know, and sometimes you'll see that in a rural community. Mm -hmm. um, and so each person's context and the conditions within which they live dictate and determine what choices they can even make to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to get to a place of health equity, everybody has to have a fair opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. So Natalie, you got into the space because a lot of times people think of this as um, poor people or people of color not having access, but you got into this space in a very interesting way. Tell me your story. <laughs> well, uh, when I was 19, I was in college living in a dorm and I started to get a series of phone calls about my grandparents' health. And so I'm a child of immigrants, of Jamaican immigrants, and I grew up in a multi-generational household in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. And because of that, had a very close relationship with my grandparents. And our family really experiences health as a whole family. So in other words, you really have no privacy when it comes to your health, but you also <laughs> have everybody's support when it comes to your health. Mm -hmm. And so with that... Um, you know, knowing what was going on with my grandparents and understanding the difficulties that they had navigating healthcare in particular, I wanted to understand how this health happened. 
how do people, some people, seem to have every opportunity to be healthy and other people don't? Our family wasn't poor. We were educated. Um, you know, my grandparents, my grandfather had a good retirement, et cetera, et cetera, but still struggled to get what they needed in order to have the best possible health. So from there, I tried to find every opportunity to see health from every possible angle. So whether that was working with the government, whether that was doing federal health policy analysis, working at an ambulatory care unit, I wanted to understand how does this production of health really happen? And then in 2004, decided to co-found Common Health Action. Uh, as a way to really develop people and organizations to produce health through equitable policies, equitable programs, and equitable practices. Mm -hmm. So you are in this space. You work with all kinds of companies in order to start them to think about this space. But when you and I spoke earlier this week, you were telling me that the whole idea of equity was not something that people readily grabbed hold to in terms of no. the business community and so forth. Yeah, so it's interesting because generally people think of health as being about personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the doctor? What did you eat today? Do you choose to exercise, et cetera, et cetera? And certainly within organizations and companies, the idea of health tends to focus on access to health care through health insurance. Mm -hmm. And you'll have some employers who will do employee wellness programs. But what they don't see is that the decisions they make as a company have implications for people's health more broadly. And so when we would go in and talk to folks who were outside of traditional health work and say, you play a role in the production of health and I want to talk to you about health equity, their eyes would glaze over and they would say, we don't do health. <laughs> and so what we realized is a better framework was to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion because people are familiar with what diversity and inclusion mean. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to kind of open the door to have the conversation, because the reality is, if you look around the world, societies that are more equitable, more diverse and more inclusive have better health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's not just about personal behavioral choices. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really about how do we set up society so people have access to what they need to make the best possible choices, the healthy choices. Right. Mm -hmm. Do people live in communities where they have clean air, where they have clean water? Do they live in communities where their kids can go outside and play, or is it too dangerous for them to even do that? Those are all things that factor into whether or not people have opportunities to be healthy. So what we decided to do was to really work with companies and organizations to figure out what's their role in the production of health beyond maybe mm -hmm. an employee wellness program, beyond maybe providing access to health insurance. So if they make a decision to locate a plant someplace, mm -hmm. or if they decide to, to cut 600 jobs. What's the health impact of that on a community or a population of people? And helping them to understand they play a role in the production of health means that they can be more conscious of it when they make their decisions and when they take certain actions so that they know that they aren't harming the health of people who are in communities around them. So whose responsibility is it ultimately then in terms of health equity? Um, is it all of our responsibility or do we just leave it to the government and to health organizations and to businesses to take care of it for us? It is all of our responsibility. So every individual plays a role, certainly from their personal choices, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. each of us in terms of the decisions we make in society every single day have health impacts. And so even I mentioned earlier this idea of is a grocery store in a community, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot that goes into deciding whether that even happens. So I can make the best choices that I can make, but I can only do that if I have access, let's say, to healthy food. So all of us play a role. You know, the, the, the supermarket that decides to locate in a community, the zoning commission that decided to allow that supermarket to locate in that community, the policymakers in terms of the tax structure that they might make in a community, all of that factors into whether me as an individual, whether I have access to that grocery store. Mm. So it's not just government. It's not just private industry. It's not just people who are living in the community and the individual. It is absolutely all of us that are part of this production of the public self, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, I tell you, the thing that you, know, you run into with the whole, I mean, this is the whole system is broken. I mean, from really stem to stern, if you think about when you say, um, you know, access to healthy foods, the problem is a lot of people who have access, you know, they do have access to it, can't afford it. 
I mean, when you look at, you know, people on fixed budgets, you have people who may be in, in a community where their you know, relative income is, is not that high. So they have to make a choice. Mm-hmm. Do I get the dollar meal for McDonald's where I can feed you know everybody or do I spend fifteen dollars and get I may eat healthy, but I can't necessarily feed everybody. The, I mean, unfortunately, so the way the society is set up, you know, the, you got to get past the greed factor because everybody wants to make money, yeah. you know, and uh, you look at the grocery stores and the, you know, everybody says, I want more, more, more. You know, employees want more. Everybody wants more. But unfortunately, so there's a system when you look at medications, food, uh, health care, you know, everything you has to a pay cost. for all of yeah, that. Everything, everything has, has a cost. cost. Yeah. So you run into that scenario. And so, you know, and, and I agree uh with Ms. Burke in terms of the just, I mean, it's, it is everybody's responsibility. How, you know, where do you really start? Um, you know, what part of it, it really has to come from the top down. It has to be precedences set, you know, from the top, meaning in Washington to say, okay, this is what, you know, what we need to see happen and let it filter down. And, you know, I mean, that's the only way I see it ever getting Getting, yeah, because I mean the the cost of health care, you know, insurance costs. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of people say they just choose not to, you know, have health insurance uh, because they can't afford it, and everything has that high cost to it. And that's, it, I mean, there's so many factors that are broken with this whole thing. I mean, I agree with everything. How do you achieve it? Because there's so many pieces that have to be fixed to make that work. Natalie, are you there? And do you have a solution for I how see. we start? <laughs> oh, just one? Just one. <laughs> so life were only so simple. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, you know, to answer your question, I'm going to back up a little bit. And I'm going to say that often when we have this conversation, um, we will talk about health disparities. Mm-hmm. And and really, we need to differentiate, and then, I, and then I'll go from there. There's okay. a difference between health, dis- health disparities and health inequities. Health disparities are merely differences in health status and health outcomes between people and populations, right? Health mm-hmm. inequities are disparities in health that are preventable, avoidable, and unjust. And they're, re- they're results mm. of public policy in particular, Okay, that creates those inequities. And the example that I can use is if you look at Flint, Michigan, and the water crisis and the exposure Mm -hmm. to lead and children being exposed to lead. Those are public policy decisions that made it so that those children and families are exposed to lead and have been for years. And as a result of that, those children will have lifelong challenges, cognitive challenges associated with that exposure to lead. That was a public policy decision. So set that aside for a second and recognize that we really need to talk about why health inequities happen and how that's driven when you say keep from on high and, and, and at the federal level about mm-hmm. public policy decisions. And now take that down and let's think about it like this. Education, as in K-12 education and beyond in the United States, is one of the biggest predictors of your health outcome. Not health education, just regular old K-12 education. If educational policy in the United States does not guarantee every single child and every single person gets a quality education, they are more likely to be sick and to die sooner. That being said, Mm. it's all connected because your education certainly connects to your employment, right? So when you Mm -hmm. talk about not having enough money to go to the store and buy the things that are going to be the healthy options for you, right? So education is connected to employment. Employment is connected to housing. So are you making a living wage, a wage that you're able to live in quality housing where it's safe, where you're not, you know, exposed to roaches or to rats, which are also also health threats? Mm -hmm. But you see education is connected to employment, is connected to housing, right? Mm -hmm. And where you live is connected to transportation. Do you have access to public transportation? Must you travel by car? And if you are in a community where there's a lot of traffic, what does that do to the air quality? So all of these determinants of health are working together all the time. So when you say, what is the answer? The answer is that through public policy in particular, we need to make policy and say, what's the health impact of this? How do we ensure that this supports good health outcomes instead of leading people on a path to disease and early death? So and the way that you do that mm-hmm. is equity. So when I use the word equity, one of the things I also think is important, Barbara, is to say equity is about understanding who experiences the benefits and who experiences the burdens 
of policies and practices, mm. right? And who experiences the benefits and the burdens of every decision that I make as a leader. And when I think about that, and I know that I'm creating a burden by making this decision or putting forward a public policy that could impact health, it gives me the opportunity to make a different decision, that, that I can actually make a decision that's going to produce health, that's going to give people access, that's going to make the healthy choice available to them and easy for them. So uh, this is really a, a shift in terms of thinking, period. I mean, because I would think that most people who are not, you know, experiencing the health care, in, in quotes, on a on a daily basis would not think of necessarily think of what they do leading to a health outcome. And so the way that you just explained that means that there has to be a mind shift in terms of policymakers, in terms of leadership uh, to always keep health in mind as they're making these decisions. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, the good news is that whether it's local health departments, whether it's hospital systems, um, quite frankly, as an outgrowth of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, they are really starting to look more upstream, is what we would say in public health, Mm -hmm. to understand why we're seeing what we see downstream. And so even hospital systems and health departments are getting involved in conversations that go beyond, do you have access to to prenatal care or do you have access to emergency room care? Do you have access to medication? They're looking beyond that and saying, why did you need access to medication to begin with? Right? Mm. So are you diabetic? Well, why are you diabetic? Well, you're diabetic because you're overweight. Well, why are you overweight? Well, maybe you didn't have access to the food that you needed, and so you were eating a lot of empty calories in order to be full, driving you to be heavier. And maybe you don't have the ability to engage in physical activity because you live in a community that's unsafe. Mm. Well, why is your community unsafe, and why don't you have access to healthy food? Well, maybe there's a zoning policy that needs to be changed in order to help that to happen. So you see what I'm saying? These pieces are all connected, and if you keep asking why, at the doctor's office, even doctors now are starting to say, well, you know, are you working? You know, do you have a job? And they're not asking that because they want to know, can you pay your bill? They're asking that because they want to understand the larger context of what's happening in your life. Are you living in a situation where, you know, you're, you're living in poverty? That leads to chronic stress. Chronic stress leads to hypertension, leads to diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So when somebody is unemployed, they're more likely to be sick. Mm. So all of these pieces are connected, and it's part of our job, really, to begin to change the conversation Mm. um, and to say that health is about more than personal behavior. Personal behavior is important. Don't get me wrong. And we all have a responsibility to make the best choices available to us. But then that piece about best choices available to us is the next piece of the equation. Mm -hmm. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. What do you think about what Natalie is discussing? What do you think about health equity and how we all need to consider it, no matter what we do in in life, how it affects us from a societal perspective? 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Dr. Newby. Uh, well, you know, if you um, start looking at uh, some of those very important points that Ms. Burke brought up, look, you know, but one of the things that I run into as a mm-hmm. physician is, you know, first, you have to have people who you have to engage them to want to be better, um, which is a tough part because you they have, you know, you get a group of people that have so many obstacles against them from societal to, you know, the racial divide that we have seen so prominent now in the country, Um, you know, and unfortunately, so we don't vote. And, you know, that comes back up to that issue where, you know, if you have a, a, you know, the so-called base that drives a lot of people to make decisions until the new base begins, Mm -hmm. um, you know, then it's going to be hard to really make some of these necessary changes uh, because they're not going to, most people in Congress are not going to, if they're not, if nobody's beating them up on a regular basis to, to, have, them, this yeah, to, yeah, to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. If it's just a few people and they have, you know, the, you know, they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If the wheel's not squeaking, I mean, they're going to just blow it off. Like seemingly they always do. Uh, and I don't not saying that globally, uh, fortunately. So that's the reality is getting, 
each individual to want to be better and meaning they get involved in, in the, the whole process. That's when I say at the top, that mm-hmm. public policy is only going to change if people say I need it to change. But if you have another base of saying I don't want it to change because I want to stay like it is and they're the louder voice, that's mm-hmm. where I see problems arising. Because, you know, if you really think about it, I mean, this re- this problem is really not complex. We've made it complex, you know, getting, I mean, you, know, we, you know, we look at uh, you know, how we get medications, how we live our lives, what we're exposed to. What do you see on commercials? What types of foods do you see on commercials? What are access? What are our jobs? You know, you really think about it. The system is is just flawed. And, and that's where our, our problems come in. But if you say, okay, let's clean the slate. Let's create a new scenario that we could really live by. Mm-hmm. All these problems would go away. <laughs> I mean, well, one of the things, Natalie, is that, that clearly people we've got to start having this conversation and people are having this conversation. As a matter of fact, you are going to be the keynote speaker for the Greater Hampton Roads Population Health Summit, which is going to be held on November the 27th um, at EVMS at the Brock Institute. Um, and unfortunately, it is sold out. So don't everybody don't go running to, <laughs> to the line at this point. But um, there is information online about this and we would suggest that you call uh, or that you email Brock Institute at evms.edu if you have any questions I believe that there may be a waiting list um, but Natalie doing things such as as uh, population health summits and and other ways of getting the word out is that the best way from a I guess a grassroots level to bring the awareness of equity to everyone so that we can start working on this problem I think it is because I think we need to reframe the conversation about health to being mm-hmm. about more than health care and health insurance. Those things are very important, and we should never lose those off the radar screen. But at the same time, it gives us the opportunity to really talk about health as a bigger thing, something in which we all have a role and responsibility. And honestly, I think that's exciting. This is not just about what can we prevent from happening in terms of illness, disease, and early death. This is about really creating a country that we know we can have by having healthy people, healthy family, healthy children, healthy communities. And, you know, to go back to Keith's comment earlier, I think part of this is about when you think about the political parties and the divisiveness, the racism that we're seeing, the xenophobia, the anti-Semitism, and so on and so forth, that is part of what is making us sick and killing us. It's costing all of us. So if my neighbor is sick and unwell, that has implications for me and my life, absolutely. But even more deeply than that is this idea about how do we value one another as human beings? Mm. Right. Mm. And so the, the, the root, when you think about when we look at racism and prejudice and xenophobia and all of the hatred that we're seeing emerge in the world that's playing out in our political parties, that is very much about how is it that we are failing to value one another as fully human. And so we have a responsibility to really think about how can we make public policy in ways that allow us to be in relationship with one another, Mm-hmm. And by being in relationship with one another, begin to value each other's humanity enough that your health becomes my concern. That's exactly. what we need to be doing. Uh, our phones are lit up. So let's go to the phone lines, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Catherine joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Catherine. You're on the air. How you doing? I'm doing great. Um, Yes, I was calling in on the topic today because it's literally something you can see as soon as you cross a railroad track. You know, Um, I am from Norfolk, Virginia, Mm -hmm. and in the Ghent area, you know, you can see a fresh market and they have a massage place and cold press, you know, and then you go under the railroad track and the other side is a food lion and an ABC store and a city trend. You know, it's like a Chinese restaurant, you can see the absolute difference in the way that they planned out the layout for the different cities, you know, the different Mm -hmm. parts of the city, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, it's, I mean, it's, you can visually see it, you know, it's crazy. So it's like, we do have to get more on the planning side and go to the civic league meetings and let them know, like, we want a fresh market on this side, you know, like we, we want a cold press on this side of the trail, or you know, on on this side of the train tracks. Um, it's just, 
It's really crazy. I, under, I, I hear what you're saying, Catherine. Let's let uh, Natalie respond. Go ahead, Natalie. And, you know, Catherine, one of the things that's important is a lot of times we can look at our communities and the way things have been arranged and built and see what's there. Um, also, not just what's missing, but what's there that's working against us. Mm-hmm. So we know, for instance, that when you go into communities where there are payday lending stores on every corner, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's about economic inequity and predatory lending. That's what keeps people in poverty. And poverty is one of the things, again, creates chronic stress, and chronic stress creates chronic disease. So when we're thinking about, you know, that availability to fresh food, et cetera, and you are absolutely on point with that, we also need to look and say, wow, how many liquor stores are in our community? You know, yeah. um, h- how many payday lending places are in our community versus, you know, how many gyms are in our community or how many places where community can actually gather and be in relationship with each other or places where we can get good food, mm-hmm. right? So it is very much about that civic engagement at a local level to create those conditions where people can actually be healthy. Absolutely. Tina joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Tina. You're on the air. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd like to advocate for the equity of Medicare for All. Uh, there's a bill that's HR 676 that is has been introduced over the years uh, in the House that's still in there that needs to be supported. That is the gold standard for a new and improved Medicare. We've already got the bones in place. We just need to fill in the loopholes and extend it from cradle to grave. And I believe this is equity because the way that the uh, bill is set up It is a everybody in, nobody out system where the wealthy and the politicians and the people that seek to undermine programs that they are not directly um, being treated under will not be able to do that because it would undermine their own health care. And it's also freedom because people do not have to um, be in a job they don't want. They can move where their talents take them. So... um, it, and it also costs much less in the long run. We need health care and not insurance. Insurance serves no purpose to health whatsoever. Okay, Tina, thank you so much for your call. We appreciate that. Um, Natalie, it's health care, uh, insurance, all of that is a part of this, but it's not all of it. It's a part of it, and it's not all of it. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because this is why we need to think about the health impact of things long term. Because when you think of it from a public policy standpoint, in the United States, we made a decision decades ago to make your insurance and your access to health care connected to your employment. We didn't have to do that, right? We actually can separate those two things if we believe that access to care is a basic human right and the opportunity to be healthy is a basic human right. There are countries that have that in their constitution that say you have a right to be healthy. So in a country that I know I love, but I know is far from perfect, mm-hmm. I would ask the question, what will it take for us to get there? And I think in order for us to get there, it's like having conversations that's going to happen at the Population Health Summit to really get people to open their eyes and to see we have an opportunity to produce health and there are different ways to do that and that we each can find a role to play in that. You know, one of the things we haven't talked about, too, this also um, enters the field of of how you are treated when you get health care. Um, you, you were talking about a study that uh, of um, African-American women um, and babies. We already know that that the uh, African-American community has a huge infant mortality rate. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that study and where you Absolutely. were coming from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so. Um, there's a documentary called Unnatural Causes, and in it, there's a segment called When the Bell Breaks. And in that segment, it talks about African-American infant mortality and really trying to understand why, after decades of throwing everything in the kitchen sink at black infant mortality, have we not made any progress? So we're looking at women in the documentary who are college educated, married, have prenatal care, planned pregnancies, don't smoke, access to insurance. I mean, live in affluent communities and their rates of of death, of infant mortality are through the roof and completely unacceptable. So then they ask the question, well, then maybe it's something wrong with black women's bodies. You know, maybe Mm -hmm. black women's bodies are inherently broken. Maybe there's something genetic at play as to why black babies don't survive. So they said, well, if that's the case, then let's go to Africa and look at black women in Africa to understand what their infant mortality rates are. 
Well, when they checked, black women in Africa who didn't have college education necessarily or prenatal care or the socioeconomic status of the women in the United States were having better, out, better health outcomes. Hmm. And what they did was to follow the daughters of those women from Africa to the United States to see what their birth outcomes would be. And lo and behold, within one generation of those women being in this country, their babies started to die at the same rate as African-American women who had been in the country for generations. There's something else at play. Black women's bodies are not broken. We, we can have healthy babies, but we have to have the conditions to do that. And there's a belief that the reason infant mortality is so high for African-American women is because of chronic stress, stress that comes from race, facing racism even when they are in their mother's wombs. And so there's something called allostatic load, which is the manifestation of stress at a cellular level that basically sets us up for illness, disease, early death, and infant mortality. So we've got to begin to deal with these issues around racism um, that take place throughout our lives that could manifest as being followed around a store when you're shopping and that feeling of knowing you're being watched or unwelcome, knowing that you've been in a job and you deserve to be promoted and someone else who, who is not black, someone else who's not a woman ends up getting promoted right? Yeah. Um, the, the mistreatment, in essence, and the mishandling that black women experience throughout a lifetime are what pour into them this stress that then makes it so that when it's time for them to have their babies, that their babies don't even get the same opportunity to live. Wow. So we, and I mean, this is at a cellular level. We don't even realize the women that, that they're under that type of stress. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it even happens from childhood with little girls. So if you think about even the issues around dolls, okay, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm of a certain age that I know when, when I was a little girl, we just started to really get access to black dolls. Mm -hmm. So for little black girls who don't have the opportunity necessary to just necessarily to see themselves reflected in a lot of things, who, who didn't necessarily see the opportunity to feel and be beautiful and be considered beautiful in their natural state, that hangs over you for a lifetime of not feeling good about yourself. That, that, that counts against you in a way. That has an effect on you, you know? And so we really have to look at how have we structured society to value people? What does it take to value a black woman enough, give mm -hmm. her access to everything that she needs so that she can have that successful birth outcome that she deserves? Because mm -hmm. if you believe that she is valuable, equally valuable, that she's a contributor to this society and she has something to offer, we have a responsibility to make sure that she has every opportunity to be healthy. And if mm. we're not doing that, we're failing. Keith, I see you look puzzled well, no, a little no, bit. No, no, I'm just <laughs> it's uh, I'm, thought. As, as I'm thinking about this uh, particular study, I guess my question would be, I mean, if they say in one generation of women, of that, women that came over yeah, from Africa, here, mm -hmm. I guess the question becomes is, I mean, is it, fully something as relates to stress versus any other factors that could be involved, meaning, you know, types of foods we're eating here versus there, you know, mm -hmm. which I mean, cause I've always wondered, you know, I, I go into a grocery store now and I see peppers about the size of like freaking, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you I'm know, watermelon, yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, everything is the changed. Genetics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure they, they engineer and everything that, that, I mean, I don't know what we're exposed to nowadays. I mean, because everything's bigger, supposed to be better, and I don't know what we're eating these days mm -hmm. in terms of how that may be playing a factor. So I'm not disputing the data. The I just, I just question whether or not it's solely that, or there, there's a multitude of factors. Because one generation, that's pretty quick, you know. Um, you know, for that to impact on infant mortality, that's really fast. You want to respond to that, Natalie, before we go back to the phones? Sure. And mm -hmm. so, yes, there would be many factors, but in the documentary, the scientists were in there very clear at pointing to the chronic stress that comes from the experience of racism in this society as being a primary factor in why they believe those women are experiencing that type of shift in birth outcome. Mm. So it's that they, they in, 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 in essence, what they did was they accounted for those differences in the study. And but that's what led so them to say, yeah. yes. And uh -huh. so that's what led them to say, this is about this type of stress manifesting mm -hmm. at a cellular level. And so this is why we need to address this. Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't figure out another reason. They couldn't point to something else that was dramatically different that would lead to that type of shift in birth outcome. 
Mm. Wow. If you're just joining us, we're talking about ways to ensure that everyone, regardless of circumstance, has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. My guests are Natalie Burke, president and CEO of Common Health Action, a national public health organization, and my co-host of Another View on Health, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. I'm Barbara Ham Lee, and you're listening to Another View. Let's get back to our phones. Let's see. I want to make sure I pronounce this correctly. Dawood from Newport News joins us. How are you? Fine. How y'all doing this e- this evening? We're doing fine. Back up off the phone just a little bit, <laughs> and I, you'll be good. I was, I, was, I was glad that she mentioned natural causes because that's a very, very good, clear documentation that everybody needs to get a hold on, and you could probably find it at your local library if you go seek and search. But I also would like to say this. It's also about accountability and responsibility. Our problem in our community as being a me, as being a community activist and been involved in this community for over 20 years is access to information. And access to information means that, like she was talking about the, uh, the cellular level and how this affects and impacts people of African descent who uh, might migrate to America. But it was a brother from the Bronx that I knew, Dr. Amos Wilson. He wrote a book called The Psychological Development of the Black Child. And in that documentation, he also shows you the impact of racism that we don't even factor in. Not only the racism that we deal with, but the systemic racism that we have to deal with every day just being black in America. But you also know that we just don't have food deserts. We have swamp towns. Like you say, when you come to a black community, yeah, there's a railroad crossing. But they also, the interstate, when you come off the interstate, you got a McDonald's. You got uh, all these uh, a fast food place. And yeah. things that, that impact our life. And one thing that I come to find out is from Richmond to down to this area, it's considered a stroke belt. Why yeah. is it considered a stroke belt? Because like you were saying earlier, not only do our, uh, what you call it, our social security card is important, but our zip codes factor in those same thing that's as important absolutely do i we got we our lines are full and so i'm going to move on but we hear what you're talking about in terms of the all of the determinants that keep us from being healthy thanks so much for the call 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 sophia joins us from norfolk hi sophia you're on the air hi good afternoon thank you so much for taking my call barbara i'm really enjoying this program thank you um Thanks. I was calling because uh, I want, we were talking about access to health care, the right to health care, the right to be healthy. And there's a large group of our community that I feel does not have that right, and that group is military members. And the reason for that is because in 1950, the Ferris Doctrine was passed by the Supreme Court, which prevents military members, active duty or those activated reservists, from being able to sue the United States if they are uh, or their families from being able to sue if they've been killed. Um, for medical negligence. So you would think it would be a right if you went into the hospital and um, you brought a family member and due to a doctor's negligence, something like not washing hands or not following procedures or walking out of the room and missing a hemorrhage, something really egregious, um, that you would be able to bring that person to justice and have justice for your loved ones. Mm -hmm. And this is something that military members are not entitled to the intention of the Ferris Doctrine was to pr- kind of like the Good Samaritan Law, so that if someone tried to save you in combat, they wouldn't be held legally responsible. But in order to save the government money, it's been expanded. So you, there have been um, active duty women that have gone in to have a baby, and again, due to negligence, have um, hemorrhaged and passed away, and they have their families have no recourse. And there are, there are many other, if you look online, there are many other tragic stories along this line. So I just wanted to bring this to light wondered if uh, your guest, who's a cardiologist, had any thoughts on this. Um, And just thank you for your time and the ability to share this with your listeners. Thank you, Sophia, for the call. Keith? Uh, Well, uh, you know, that's always a tough one because, you know, I I think like anything else, the way medicine has morphed now, you know, it used to be once upon a time you could sit there with a patient for a half hour or more and, you know, have conversation and kind of, figure out what's going on. You had time to think through and, and make mm-hmm. decisions, you know, but nowadays, you know, you go to the VA system, it's like 800 people sitting out there waiting and you have to see 40, 50, whatever numbers, uh, you know, visit. 
So they're forced to kind of, you know, do this system quickly and mm-hmm. get these patients in and out. I was, I was, I was glad that they changed it so that now the veterans can, can come, come out. Yeah. Come, come out people to see you. Yeah, like exactly. You. And I know she was talking more active duty military, but mm-hmm. I, when I was in medical school, I had to rotate through the Portsmouth Naval hospital way mm-hmm. back when, and that was part of my internal medicine rotation. So I was in their clinic. So I saw how many people they, they saw a day and it was pretty extensive. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, and, and I think like anything else, it's just a system problem that they're yeah. going to have to make some alterations, but I, I definitely understand you know her her point with that, Natalie. Do you what is the attitude of of healthcare workers in terms of health equity? So it's interesting, um, and and it's very complicated. Uh, you know, we've certainly done work um, with uh, schools of medicine um, and other types of entities like the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to talk about what does it mean to really bring equity into the practice of healthcare. Uh, it's clear in the literature that bias factors into the way that clinicians engage with patients, and mm-hmm. that then can change the way that they interact with and lead to poor outcomes. And so, you know, an example of this, and it's, it, you know, it's kind of crazy to even say it, but this is the way that it, it has been working, is that in the literature, um, clinicians have been found to have an internal belief that black people can tolerate pain better, Mm -hmm. um, that when they're asked to rate their pain on a scale from one to 10, that they're more likely to exaggerate their pain um, and that they're more likely to become addicted to opioids. It's just, it's, it's an inherent belief. It's an an implicit bias. And on the flip side, they believe that white patients cannot tolerate pain, tend to understate their pain, and it's unlikely that they will become addicted to opioids. And so in a backwards way, at a time when prescribing for opioids has gone up significantly, black people have not been getting opioid prescriptions at the rate of their white counterparts. And so when we look at this opioid crisis that we see, what's now been deemed a crisis in the country that's affecting white middle class America, they're in, in behind it in, in a, a really insidious kind of way, implicit bias is playing out. And helping to drive that addiction, and you that know, we're seeing. the the whole idea of the implicit bias actually can be de- almost deadly. Also, I um, actually have a friend who um, is African American, whose girlfriend is Native American, and he had a medical emergency. He's on a pain regimen and was being treated um, with opioids on a pain regimen. When she, when they got to the emergency room, the doctors refused to listen to her in terms of understanding that he was under this pain reg- regimen and they gave him the lock zone and he had a heart attack mm-hmm. and so this the whole idea of you know not listening to patients and not believing them um and for for a variety of reasons but but bias and and racism quite frankly um played uh, at least that's their feeling is that it played a, a major role in that luckily he did not pass um and is doing okay mm-hmm. now but that's mm-hmm. a problem well, and know. we got about four minutes yeah. left in the show. Go ahead, Natalie. Well, I will say, you know, and if people are familiar with uh, Serena Williams' childbirth story, which is so alarming in so many ways, she had given birth, had surgery, was in the hospital room, short of breath, went to the nurse's station, said, I can't breathe. And the nurse basically said, you'll be fine. Go back to the room. And she said, no, I can't breathe. I have a history of blood clots. And she was like, no, no, it's probably because of the surgery. And she insisted that they check her. And had to fight for it. This is Serena yeah. Williams, one of the wealthiest, most well-recognized black women in the world, who's brilliant and, 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 and powerful. Mm-hmm. And had she not pushed, they would never have discovered that, yes, she did have blood clots in her body and she could have died. And so, yeah. you know, I'm going to talk about this at the Population Health Summit. But the question for me, to some degree, is when someone, when a black person says, I can't breathe, mm-hmm. I can't breathe, whether mm-hmm. it's in the healthcare system whether it's when they're being detained by police, when they say, I can't breathe, whether it's from the stress that's coming from being in a job where they're devalued, um, whether it's being dehumanized in different ways, what does it take for society to hear, I can't breathe, and to know that breath is necessary for us to have health and to have life? 
Absolutely. Natalie Burke, it will be here uh, on November the 27th, the Greater Hampton Roads Population Health Summit. If you'd like to know more about the summit, you can go to Brock Institute at evms.edu to find out more information. Natalie, I know that this is going to be an incredibly um, uh, insightful and great day in terms of the people who have already registered for the health summit and will be attending and be able to listen to you. I have the pleasure of serving as the MC for the day and also moderating two panel discussions where we'll be talking about uh, ways that people can come together to collaborate, to create health equity, as well as um, finding out what a lot of the local groups are doing in our area to create health equity. Ah, I was just getting ready to call, take Terrence, but there was a gentleman on the phone. I was just getting ready to take his call. He wanted to say hello to you, Natalie. I don't know his last name. All I know is his first name was Terrence, and they said that he knows you. So I passed the message along. <laughs> so much, hey, Terrence. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you'd like to say before we go? We got about two minutes left in the show that you would like people to think about in terms of health equity and as we move forward in this movement. I think it's that our health is connected. We are connected to one another as human beings and our health is connected. And we Mm -hmm. have to begin to look beyond the obvious in terms of um, can we get to see a doctor when we need a doctor and to think about how do we keep from needing to see the doctor to begin with. And so it's through being in relationship with people by valuing one another and making health a priority. Mm -hmm. Every aspect of it, our personal health and the decisions that we make every single day Um, as well as the health of our communities by being engaged, by understanding what policy is doing locally at a state level and at a federal level, that we will create equitable opportunities for all people to achieve their best possible health. Okay. We look forward to um, having you here in the Norfolk area. Have you been here before? I have. It's been a while, but I have. Oh, okay, fantastic. It. Well, we look forward to seeing you. And Dr. Doobie, you get the last You get the last word. <laughs> well, <laughs> 30 so, seconds. What, what can you say after that? Uh, so I would just say as far as the uh, providers that are seeing patients, just remember the oath we took, you know, first do no harm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that about this is we really should be treating everybody equally. Absolutely. Right. Thank you both so very much. And we will be right back. I'm with Marcellus, and you all are checking out another view. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. And welcome back. Comic book legend Stan Lee passed away this week at the age of 95. During his career, Lee created a culture of millions of fans who diligently follow the storylines of his iconic superheroes like Spider-Man, the Hulk, and Black Panther, just to name a few. This weekend, Norfolk State University is giving graphic artists of all ages an opportunity to channel their inner Stan, Stan Lee as they compete for prizes and have their own comic creations critiqued by some of the best in the business. Our Lisa Godley recently sat down with one of the organizers of what is sure to become an annual event. Don't freeze. I never freeze. Stanley broke ground in 1966 when he decided that an African king would be the next comic book superhero, and he named him Black Panther. My son, it is your time. Lee said it was the real-life heroes of the civil rights movement who had inspired him. Little did he know that some 50 years later, his Black Panther, aided by his scientifically advanced kingdom, would rise from the pages of a comic book, leap onto the big screen, and smash box office records. You get to decide what kind of king you are going to be. American comics aren't just generating big bucks. They're influencing our culture. That's why when Brian Tillman's dean asked him how they could reach a younger audience, 
Tillman, whose background is in comics and storyboards, knew just what to do. I had suggested comics. That's my specialty. And I was like, that's where it's at. You know, you get the youth with comics. NSU decided to make it a competition and tie it into the upcoming American Evolution commemoration. 2019 marks the 400th anniversary of several events that have shaped America, including the arrival of the first Africans at Old Point Comfort, also known as Fort Monroe. And the idea was that they would take the stories of the first Africans that came to the continental U.S. in 1619 and then retell it in a fantasy setting or a sci-fi setting or a Western setting or a horror setting, however they felt to tell the story. And while the deadline to enter NSU's graphic novel competition has passed, this weekend's conference is free and open to creative artists of all ages, offering them an opportunity to show what they can do to the best in the business. Everyone loves a good comic convention to come in and see the art, talk to people. And we're bringing in 12 guests from around the entertainment industry, from video games to comics to toys. And they're going to come and do lectures from 10 to 6 on November 18th. And there'll be also an artist alley where they can see people's work and do portfolio reviews. And everyone can just come in and have a great time. So this is actually a great opportunity for anybody who's an aspiring Absolutely. artist to just come and, and have their work, this maybe is, even critiqued. Yes, this is probably one of the best ways to do it because there are a lot of comic conventions that are in the area, but you got to pay for them. This is free. <laughs> so, you know, Norfolk State is actually offering it up to the public for free. And so all you have to do is come, find the artist you want to talk to, have your portfolio ready to go and say, would you mind taking a look at it? Because most of the artists love giving back to the artistic community. So if there's a high school student, grad student, not even a student, but just someone who's interested in it and they go, would you mind looking at my work? There's not an artist that's going to be in Artist Alley. They'll be like, no. So it would be a great opportunity to bring people if they're interested in art in general would also be a good opportunity for them to get a free critique. Tillman says the goal is to have more such conventions in the future. But if you love comics, particularly creating them, you won't want to miss the first one this weekend. Because who knows, the next comic book genius might be right here in Hampton Roads. Come out. It's free. It's absolutely free. It's going to be a great event. And, you know, normally when you have to do, when you want to come to something like this, you got to put down at least $60, $70 just to walk through the door. And then if you want to go talk to these people, especially one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to have to pay another $70, another $100. And we're just going here. This is for the community. We really want to bring everyone into Norfolk State, show them what we're doing, how we are connected with the 1619. And, you know, we're really trying to bring this type of art, this history and art and community all in one space and then going, here it is for free. We're doing this for you. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. So all of you aspiring artists out there, go check it out. Lots to ponder from our guests today. So if you'd like to listen to the show again, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. While you're there, please sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. We're on Facebook, so like us. And I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. The Another View crew is taking a break next week to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday. And we wish you and yours a very safe and happy holiday. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Janae Jackson answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Happy Turkey Day, y'all. Always be grateful. And thank you so very much for listening to Another View. Another View.